Good morning. Good morning. I'm kind of warm. Do you want to go outside? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. You sure? Once, once a week in a blizzard is my limit. Oh, all right. Well, so then we'll wait until Thursday and we'll do it yeah. again then. Well, once a year. Oh, once a year? Yeah, sorry. So that's your limit now. Sorry. All right. So I hope you're all enjoying the fact that we're inside and not outside. Although it was really a unique experience to, on Christmas Eve, yeah. be in the front yard. I'm glad that we did it, but maybe next time we won't. <laughs> it's one of those things, you're glad that you did it once, but you have not a large desire to ever do it again. Yeah, yeah. that sounds right. Okay. Fantastic. So it'll be a good memory. Uh, all right, so let's do announcements, shall we? Yeah, um, there's only one. I don't think we have much of anything other than Happy New Year. It's coming up very, very quickly. So um, we continue in just sort of uh, the Christmas season. Uh, just so you're aware, Christmas uh, around us sort of starts to end immediately after Christmas. I'm sure there are already Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day things at your local retailer. However, the Christmas season on the Christian calendar is much, much bigger than that. So we continue with some of the themes of Christmas uh, on into the coming week as we look ahead. So I think that's all I got to say. Yeah. But do you have things to say? Yeah. As the praise team comes, comes on up, uh, I want to share a little bit about the first song that we're going to sing together. Uh, we're going to do a couple more Christmas songs that I li always like to the Sunday after Christmas. Cap it off with those songs that have the theme of uh, celebration. Like, you know, Advent is, is the looking forward toward Christ's birth and Christ's coming. And then now starts the season of Christmas itself. So, uh, so now is kind of when we, uh, as per the Christian calendar, we celebrate Christ is here now. So it's kind of a different tone. So I always on this Sunday like to sing Joy to the World and uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. And so we're gonna do those two this morning. And uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain, I learned a little bit about. Uh, and so I wanted to share just a little bit with you. And I'll read this excerpt here. There will always be some debate of over who first uncovered the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain, but Frederick Work was one of the first to note the song's power and potential. The song had come from the fields of the South, born from the inspiration of a slave's Christmas. And it was unique in that of the hundreds of Negro spirituals the Work family saved from extinction, few had been written about Christmas. Most, as would seem only natural, centered on earthly pain and suffering, in the joy and happiness that only heaven seemed to offer. Yet here, standing against the backdrop of such haunting spirituals as sometimes I feel like a motherless child, was Go Tell It on the Mountain, a triumphant piece that embraced the wonder of lowly shepherds touched by God at the very first Christmas. And as you can imagine, um, these Negro spirituals, many of them, uh, were lost because there was no written history of them. Um, there, you know, many of the composers could not read or write, and so these were passed uh, generation to generation by oral history. And so this work family, Frederick Work was a part of, uh, they made it their, uh, one of their passions, one of their um, studies was just diving into these Negro spirituals and finding out um, how they went and writing them down and getting, getting all of it documented. And so this is one of those. Uh, and we're going to sing it together. Go tell it on the mountain. So I invite you to stand.
let's take a look at a quote from St. Augustine. Uh, he was a, a church father from the fourth century, and he uh, said these words in a sermon. Uh, actually, let's read this together. Our Lord came down from life to suffer death. The bread came down to hunger. The way came down on the way to weariness, and the fount came down to thirst. And that struck me uh, this week. It's actually uh, sent in an email to all of the pastors of EFCR by Pastor Randy Heckert. And uh, it struck me in a different way this Christmas season to just think about those words and, and the way that uh, St. Augustine wrote those and the, the way the, I, the, the kind of the ir ironies kind of meet each other. And so let's thank the Lord for the grace that he came to ultimately give us the salvation and redemption that we can have because of what he did uh, as a baby, but then later on the cross. People come together.
is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Amen. You may be seated. Most in glory in the highest, he has come, our great Messiah. Come bow before him, this awesome mystery. Mighty God and fragile baby, here a lowly manger holds, and it's still the greatest story ever told. So today's a weird Sunday. Advent's over, Christmas is behind us, but it's not yet time for a new year. So it's always a weird time to pick something to preach on. But before I preach anything, there are children present who are squirming and squiggling to get out of the room. So if you guys want to head off to Kid Connection, you can do so at this time. So thinking and 
praying and investigating about what to preach on in between the end of the Christmas season and the beginning of the new year, which as a side note, when we get to the new year, we are going to jump back into the Gospel of Luke. We started a series last year called Open Invitation, uh, sort of a blow by blow through the Gospel of Luke. And um, we were in it a lot early last year, and I had every intention to go back to it in the late spring and early summer. And then, as you well know, everything absolutely changed out from under us. So we're going to get back to it starting next week, and I'm excited about that. In the meantime, we are going to talk this morning about the concept, the idea of where to next. And it comes from this question. What happens in the Christmas story, specifically in Matthew's gospel, what happens after the angels are done singing? What happens after the Christmas star has dimmed? What happens after the magi leave for their return journey home? What comes next for this family? for the Christ child, for Mary, and for Joseph. And more accurately, instead of what comes next, the real question is, where to next? Because as we're going to see, there's a lot of movement for this young family, um, and for very good reason. So let's dig right into looking at the sense of movement that we get within Jesus and his mother and his father in this early part of Mark's gospel. From Matthew chapter 2. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then skipping to verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. So you see the movement of uh, the holy family, as they're sometimes called, of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. The movement back and forth from uh, the, the native homeland of Israel, then into Egypt, and then out of Egypt, and back home again. And there's a common theme for how this direction was received by Joseph. Consistently, it was in a dream, through a vision, and an angelic-type messenger. So one of the first questions that I muddled through as I was looking at this passage is this one. Does God still speak today through dreams and visions? So on Christmas Day and the day after, I was able to sneak in a little bit of extra sleep. Now, not straight through, mind you, because we have two cats, and those cats believe that if they are not fed somewhere between the hours of 6 and 6.30 a.m., they will absolutely starve and vanish from the earth. But after getting up and feeding them their food, I was able to go back and sneak a little extra sleep. And yes, even on Christmas Day, because we have these marvelous things in our house cold called teenagers. And I know they get a bad rap for the most part for how they behave and whatnot. However, I will say on Christmas Day, when you don't start even unwrapping your gifts until after 9 a.m. and have a nice brunch of pancakes and sausage at 11.30, it is a beautiful Beautiful time to be alive. However, main point of this story is I was able to get a little extra sleep, a little bonus sleep. But in both instances, I'm not sure that it did me any good because I had the weirdest dreams in that extra bit of sleep between feeding the cats and getting up for good. Like really, like stuff I'm not even going to tell you guys about because it was really, really strange. So I found myself this week thinking, Lord, I hope you don't speak through dreams and visions anymore because I have no idea to do with these things that are happening in my brain while I'm asleep. But in Joseph's case, two instances, 
where, he, where, where we're told that in a dream, through a vision and an angelic communication, he is told to get up and to go. So, does God still use angelic or supernatural or spiritual ways to communicate? Can God still use dreams and visions? Well, one answer I have is found in Acts chapter 2 in the Pentecost sermon from Peter. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, at 41 years of age, I do not know into which category I fall anymore, if I'm still young enough to see visions or if I'm stuck dreaming dreams at this point. But we read a passage like this and we go, oh, in the last days, those days to come. No, read Acts chapter 2. The Spirit had been poured out on all flesh. There was prophecy going on in that moment. Yes, there are later days to come, but the last days began with Jesus' resurrection. We've been living in the last days for a really long time. So yes, God can still speak through visions and dreams. I mean, least of all because of what we read in Acts chapter 2, but mostly for this reason. You may not know this, let me remind you, God can do whatever God wants. So when we say, I don't know, can you still do things that way? God can do whatever God wants. The question is, are we willing and ready to hear and to receive how God might speak. I mean, if you've read scripture, you know that in the Old Testament at one point, there was a talking donkey. So the bar is really low for the way God can communicate with his people. Are we open and willing to be ready to receive how God wants to give direction for his people today? Because what we see in the passage with Mary and Joseph and Jesus, the back and the forth, is we see that God is the steady one, but his people seem to move around a lot. God is eternally rock solid and stable and secure, but it seems that his people are often called to move around. Go back to Abraham's story, the very beginning of it. He's told, take your family and go. Or fast forward to the story of entering the promised land. It's time to go. Over and over, God's people, though they follow a steady, rock-solid, firm foundation God, are told and and moved, uh, and and, uh, things change around. There's a followership that requires movement and adaptation from God's people. Sometimes in our lives today, we are called to move from the familiar to the foreign. This is what we see in Joseph and Mary's story. They left what was familiar and known. They went into something that was unfamiliar and foreign to them, from Israel to Egypt. Sometimes that's what happens in our lives. Sometimes God leads us into things that are foreign to us. We uh, leave behind things that are familiar to us, that are comfortable to us. Sometimes there's a sadness with this movement because we leave behind things or people or places or patterns or routines that have become very, very known to us. And yet we're called to go from the familiar to the foreign. Sometimes there can be some anxiety about that, and that's okay. I'm quite sure that Mary and Joseph didn't have it all figured out on the journey to get to Egypt. They were not given you know, here's your hotel key cards, here's your GPS coordinates, none of that. It was get up and go. And I love in the text that he left at night, almost as if to say, there is no time to lose. We need to get out of here. So sometimes we're called to go from the familiar to the foreign. Other times it's the other way around. It's from Egypt back to Israel. It's from the foreign back to the familiar. And these types of movements often come with a sense of joy or a sense of relief. We return to familiar people or familiar places or familiar routines. I'm sure Mary and Joseph were loving the idea on the journey back home of connecting and reconnecting with family and friends and and being um, situated within a group of people with whom they shared a history and a culture after living and adapting in Egypt for a while. Which is why I am so amazed at Joseph's obedience in these stories. It's incredible to me. Joseph's obedience. And I think that the, the, the hardest step, at least from where I'm sitting, 
for someone like Joseph, and I think for someone like us today, those very two, the, the two first words of both of those angelic communications were the same. Get up. Get up. Because I think once we've started moving in a direction we feel God is leading, once we're on the journey, there's a sense of momentum that goes along with that. But I think often the hardest part you know, they say that every journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. I mean, I get up, I think, is the hardest part. To get beyond where you are at and to say, I am going to a new place. So God is steady, his people are moving. And in this particular instance, one of the things that I love that we see is that this movement of God's people, of Mary and Joseph and Jesus back and forth, it's tied to these promises that God is fulfilling. Verses 15 and 23, if you read back through Matthew chapter 2, you will see it's evident in this movement of the family of Jesus that prophecies are being fulfilled. Old Testament prophecies are coming to fruition. Now, we shouldn't be surprised because Matthew's gospel compared to uh, the others really tries to make big connections with Old Testament prophecies uh, with the Jewish culture that came before Jesus. But in these two passages alone, we see two examples. We see um, the one where it says, out of Egypt I will call my son. And then we see the other, the other one is, he will be called a Nazarene. So these two promises given to God's people hundreds of years, generation upon generation beforehand, and yet they're being revealed now in the story of this family moving back and forth. One of those connections, the idea of coming up out of Egypt, if you read into Matthew's gospel, he uh, is doing a, a lot to tie Jesus to the idea he is the new Moses, the complete Moses, the one. If Moses was the, the, the person who delivered God's people from the slavery of Egypt, Jesus would be the one who delivers God's people from the slavery of sin itself. So the, the, the tie to Moses begins here. And then that prophecy about the Nazareth, we've talked a couple Sundays ago about this is a connection to the humble roots of Messiah. So connections all over the place to these Old Testament prophecies, these promises being fulfilled, which was a reminder to me, and I hope a reminder to you today, that we need to trust that there is something bigger happening, a bigger design unfolding around us, even when the world around us feels like it might be threatening or troubling to us. And I think that can be hard. I think when the world seems threatening and troubling, the first thing we want to do is, we, like a turtle, we kind of go inside of our shell. It's, it's hard, it's challenging. I'm not going to pretend that it isn't to say, I will trust that there is a grander design unfolding. I remember back in 2008 when we were in the midst of building the expansion on our building, um, and I got to sort of watch it be built little bit by little bit. I remember there was a time when like the foundation was laid and the exterior walls were up and then the inside what was what I would describe as a maze of stud walls. And I remember walking through that building with people who were saying, oh, this is going to be incredible. See, this is where this is going to be. The multi-purpose room will be here. The kitchen, then this nursery wing with these rooms. And I, on, those, on those little miniature tours, I would do a lot of nodding and pretending like I knew exactly because I'm looking at these random pieces of wood thinking, I don't see it. I'm, I'm not a spatial person to begin with. I've never done any real construction. So as I walked through, I just saw a bunch of random pieces of wood, you know, that were joined together in some ways. But here's the thing. I trusted that there were people who could see what I could not see. There were people who were able to look at those walls and floors and know what it was going to look like when it all came together. There were people who had these magical things called blueprints and knew that when all things were joined together after the appropriate amount of time, it would look like it looks today. And when we go through troubling, testing, or trying times, the challenge is for us is to remember and trust that God has these divine plans that are unfolding around us. And that can be hard. I can't imagine that Joseph and Mary didn't have some struggle with the idea, why in the world we're going to Egypt, we're coming back from Egypt. But in all of that, God's eternal purposes are being fulfilled. These promises are coming to fruition. And it's a beautiful thing. 
but it was still hard. The back and the forth, the moving and the moving back. And it all happened based on threats and trouble, right? I was thinking about that this week, and I thought of the phrase, rolling with the punches. Now, I knew, obviously, that this phrase has to do with people punching each other, but I I didn't know that it was deeply embedded in the sport of boxing, and that rolling with the punches is actually a a strategy that you employ in boxing. Um, I read this week that it's a boxing term that means to move one's body or head in such a way so as to decrease the force of impact on the opponent's incoming punches. It will probably shock you to know that I've never boxed in my life. (laughs) Although I will say that uh, Mike Tyson's punch out, I was pretty incredible on the Nintendo. But I've never boxed a day in my life, so I can't identify directly with this idea of rolling with the punches, but I think it fits what we're talking about here today with Mary and Joseph and Jesus because they were faced with trouble and threats, and they just had to move at God's direction with God's guidance, but they had to move. And threats and trouble can cause us to be nimble and adaptive and trusting. I mean, Jesus and his family moved from their homeland to Egypt because of the threat of what? Murder. Someone's trying to kill the child. You need to get out. Generations before, Jacob and his brothers moved. Why? The threat was starvation at that time. Whether it was starvation or murder, there was a threat that moved God's people from where they were to where they needed to be. And then Joseph and Mary, on their way home, thinking we finally get to go home, back to the homeland, let's go to Judea, and then they find out there's this guy named Archelaus who is ruling, and in some ways he's worse than Herod. And what I really liked in the text is it said that when Joseph found out about that, he was afraid. But then he was informed via another dream that, yeah, he needed to not go there, but instead go somewhere else. So, my friends, I think there, there are healthy, wise senses of fear in the world. That sense of fear of, I'm not sure if this is the right step, was affirmed by what Joseph was told in that dream and the vision. No, 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 don't go to Judea. Go instead to Nazareth. Now, generally speaking, you know, we are told, and I wholeheartedly believe, you know, do not fear, do not be afraid. All those things are true. But there are times when this practical sense of fear is affirmed, and God says, yeah, let's move and let's go another direction. But in all of this that I was reading this week, all of this back and forth, all of this from the homeland to Egypt and from Egypt back, all these threats, whether it's starvation for Jacob and his sons, whether it's murder for Joseph and his family, I found myself asking this question over and over and over again. God, why don't you just remove the threats instead of moving your people around the threats. I think that would be way better. Like, God, why didn't you just remove Herod? For Jacob and his family generations before, why didn't you just provide food where they were? Why didn't you just move Archelaus out so that Joseph could go with plan A and be in Judea? Why, God, don't you remove the threat and the trouble instead of maneuvering your people around the the threat and the trouble? And the answer that I have for you today is, I don't know. There is not one super easy, clean answer for this. Why, God, allows these threats and troubles to exist and instead of removing them, maneuvers his people around them. But I do know that God, in his time, called his children out of Egypt, out from the slavery of Pharaoh. And that God, in his time, called Mary and Joseph and Jesus back home. I don't know why God steers his people around trouble and threat instead of just removing it. I wish I did. I wish I knew. I wish I could give you a formula and use my really cool, where is it, my green laser pointer, Check that out. I could do this, and there'd be equal signs. All sorts of math would be up there. It would be phenomenal. But I don't, I don't have a clean, simple, perfect answer. But I do want to say this, sort of in conclusion. 
is that after the, the family arrives in Nazareth, after Jesus and Mary and Joseph arrive back and, and make a home in Nazareth, we know precious little about Jesus until his public ministry begins. You know, that one incident where they go to the temple and Jesus kind of gets lost and his parents are like, ah, we lost the Savior of the world, help us. Yeah, so other than that, we don't know much about Jesus' formative life in his early years. And, and I want to believe that that is because after a season of back and forth, of moving and then moving again, that there was a long season of stability for that family in Nazareth. And all of that to say, when you reach a season of stability in your life, enjoy it. Be thankful for it. I don't think God's intention for us is to constantly be under threat or trouble or moving or reacting. I do think that there are seasons of life where we are able to find a sense of stability. And when you get to one of those seasons, rejoice in it. Because you're probably going to be moving again sometime in the near future. But those seasons of stability are gifts of grace for us. And during all of this time, whether it's the moving to Egypt or the moving back or those years in Nazareth, Jesus wasn't doing anything. No public ministry is happening. And sometimes as Christians, I think we need to be reminded that um, even when we're not doing ministry, there are still opportunities to be obedient. There's an opportunity to be obedient for Joseph and his family to go. An obedient opportunity for Joseph and his family to come home. Even if we're not busy doing ministry things for one another, for the world around us, there is still ample opportunity to listen and discern and move in the ways that God is asking us to move. So, three things to think about in conclusion today, to digest this, to continue to let it sink into our hearts. And these questions are in your bulletins along with some extra material you can take home this week and continue to study. Here's the first one. Are you willing to openly listen and obey if God is calling you into a next move in the year 2021? Ask God to speak to you clearly and give you strength to obey. And maybe give God permission to speak however God wants to speak to you. Be open and willing to listen. And I'm not saying like you guys are all going to move, like, oh, you're going to, you're all moving to India. Like, I'm, I'm just saying that is God calling you into a, a new thing of any kind, a new pattern, a new whatever it might be? Listen, be open. Second, do you have trouble trusting that there is a bigger design unfolding around us in God's divine timing? Why or why not? I put this one in mostly for me because this is a struggle for me a lot. Sometimes I throw up my hands and I go, God, what are you doing? So that's a challenge for me is to trust that there's this bigger design that is unfolding around me in God's timing. And then lastly, pray for someone you know who is needing to adjust his or her life because of a troubling or threatening situation, and then allow the Spirit to lead you if, if there's any way that you could say or do anything that might help or encourage that person. And I already know who I'm going to be praying for during that time. So just allow the Spirit to sort of give that name to you that you could pray for them and, and, and cons consider ways to be an encouragement or a help. I'm going to cycle through those questions one more time, and then uh, I'll pray to close that time of reflection.
God, today, thank you for the guidance that you offer in our lives, the way that you maneuver us around according to your will if we are willing and able to listen. Open up our hearts, our ears, our eyes, our minds, that we could hear whatever you are communicating to us. And maybe it's through a dream or a vision or an angel, or maybe it's through your word or it's through the still small voice of your spirit. Maybe it's through the trusted advice of a Christian friend who wants the best for us. Allow us to openly and willingly listen to your guidance, trusting that there is indeed a a grand design unfolding around us, that we freely admit and rejoice that we'll never completely understand it, and that's truly okay. And we pray for those who are struggling, who are going through these Uh, back or forth these troubling or even threatening times. God, give them strength, give them discernment, give them peace in the middle. Allow them to see clearly where the next step is for their lives as they seek to follow you. We pray this today, Jesus, in your name. Amen. This is a song just reminding us that God holds the bigger picture. And even though if we, we can't always see the big picture, we can trust that he reigns over our lives, over the world. So I invite you to stand as we keep that in mind and worship.
Follow in his direction. and in the new year, may you follow Jesus wherever he might lead, however he might lead you, no matter what is to come next. Before I dismiss you, I want to remind you we have some poinsettias here up at the front, so if you ordered one, uh, we would love for you to take that home with you today and uh, continue to enjoy it at your home. But until we gather again here in this place for worship, for fellowship, in a new year, go in God's grace.